We will begin our afternoon elective on WPS in an era of strategic competition. And I am pleased to welcome our next moderator, a War College professor, Dr. John Caverly. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's really exciting to be here. It's been a great conference, but I'm truly convinced I'm moderating the best panel. So sorry to everyone else. Um, I think it is one of the central questions, right? How does WPS as a lens, as a philosophy, as something that is supposed to go through every part of our curriculum and every part of our research, how does it address the pivotal question of our time, which is this era of strategic competition? Um, it's really exciting to have my three colleagues up on the dais here. You're going to hear three really interesting presentations that take completely different uh, viewpoints or approaches from the grand strategic down to um, what uh, Professor Hudson was talking about, the uh, gender as practice or sex as practiced within a country and uh, throughout that gamut. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to our speakers. We'll go from left to right. Uh, we'll start with Ambassador Nelson, and we'll continue on downward. And then I'll start uh, looking for excellent questions, because I'm sure there will be a bunch. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, all. I want to begin by thanking the National Orc College and, and Syed and her team for inviting me again to join this conference. I think it's great that um, the War College has prioritized WPS for 10 years, and even better, that the conversation has been expanded to the entire college and all participants, because WPS, um, for many of us in the room, is intuitive, but I think the challenge is how do we go from intuitive to imperative? How do we make WPS the imperative so that one day WPS will be inherent? As we heard this morning in um, um, that, the excellent keynote speech. So um, I th in many of the WPS conversations that I've had the opportunity to join, I appreciate um, the passion that goes into this and the um, intuitive understanding of why it's important. The UN laid this out first more than 20 years ago. The US has uh, reinforced that with the National Action Plan and now a law unique uh, on the globe uh, signed by President Trump in 2017. But I think it's important that we stop considering um, women, peace, and security as a marginal effort, as something we'd like to add to the mix, and consider it more as a core element of success. And I think to, um, I think it's, I also like to reinforce always, you know, we've spoken about the role of male allies. I think it's, uh, this is not a gender issue in terms of who should this be important to. This is not a women's issue. This is a leader's issue. WPS needs to be important to any leader because it is a fundamental key to success. And I'd like to lay out why I think it's fundamental for us to consider as an element of strategic competition. Because the inclusion, protection, and empowerment of women is critical not only for achieving peace and security, but it is, I, I say, um, essential for us to succeed in our strategic competition with our autocratic foes. The 2022 National Security Strategy outlines two key principles to guide our national security priorities, strategic competition and global challenges. I see us as in a strategic competition of values. As state and non-state authoritarian regimes seek to erode the rules-based international order, and erase progress on human rights, the US government must set itself apart as a credible model of inclusion, equality, and democratic, democratic governance. Through the adoption and implementation of inclusive policies, such as WPS, the US government is better able to promote US values that make us stronger, safer, more prosperous, and more democratic. As we were reminded this morning, objective number one of the defense DOD strategy is model WPS. The competition of values can be stark. 
It's a choice between the subjugation of women or the empowerment of women. Colleagues in the, multilater in the diplomatic multilateral space are finding it it's getting harder to even have honest conversations about gender outside of peacekeeping and peace building, including, for example, the, f the full and equal participation of women. This includes resistance to even the most basic and previously agreed language recognizing the full and equal participation of women in the Conference on Disarmament into the UNGA res resolution this year. The national security strategy lays out the range of ch shared challenges to security that we face. These include cyber attacks, disinformation, lawfare, economic warfare, supply chain disruptions, food security, the security of energy and, and water. So beyond the old debates about what roles women can play in traditional combat, we have to appreciate and internalize that women are essential across this broad spectrum of competition and conflict. Further, resilience is critical to winning any conflict and to sustaining any peace. Civil military integration and interoperability, the sustainment of communication and, and production, the protection and sustainment of citizens and families, all of these require the participation of women. A human security framework with, with WPS at its core, a human security framework which puts all persons at the center, all persons need to be included and protected. That human security framework contrasts the competition as between security built on whole of society security of all individuals versus security based on the will and power of a single autocrat. One of the best phrases I heard last year here at this conference was, you may win a battle without women, but you'll never win a war or sustain peace without them. Sustainable peace, resilience, total defense, and security that protects and includes all, all requires the full in inclusion of women. This is not a zero-sum game. This is not something to be undertaken on the margin. This is not something that should depend on the arrival of new resources. Of course, we depend on expertise to advise us and help us find the, the, the gender equities. But this is, for a leader, this is about ensuring you have all resources employed, all resources on your team. As we heard this, we were reminded this morning, the strongest teams are diverse ones with, with broad points of view. But you cannot win, we cannot win strategic competition, and I suggest that we can, um, we have an opportunity to, uh, maximize a clear advantage over Russia and China by recognizing our ability to include women to make us stronger. Again, this is not a zero-sum game. When you look at the U.S. military and many of our allies, the U.S. military alone is, is reaching only 75% of its recruitment targets. So if you're not appealing to half the population, you're never going to get better than 75%. It's, this is not zero-sum. This is about bringing more people to the effort and more people to success. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think the idea of where, how to avoid zero-sum thinking when it comes to the WPS approach uh, in a competitive environment is something I'd like to uh, return to in the questions, I hope. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Ms. Anna Davis from the Center for Naval Warfare Studies. Thank you, John, and thank you for joining us today. And yes, I was born in Russia, and no, I'm not a spy. <laughs> and the first time I shared my um, research in women, peace, and security was in 2017 here at the Naval War College, because by that time, I saw changes. 
I saw changes in women's life. I saw new opportunities available for them in Russia in historically very conservative and patriarchal society that I knew where women traditionally for the most time like played second fiddle to men in the leadership and on the home front. But since early 2000s, um, women were allowed to serve in the military, not as conscripts like men in Russia, but signing contracts with the um, Minister of Defense and serving in every branch of armed forces. So I saw women becoming governors of regions, cities mayors, entering financial sector, and taking senior executive positions in the federal government, leading Russia's central bank, the Supreme Court, the third in command of the Russian state as woman. So in, since 2008, um, as a part of uh, Russia's sweeping military reforms between 2008 and 2010, by presidential decree, girls and women were accepted to study in historically boys and men military academies um, and military boarding schools. So I observed uh, the resurrection of women question, Ozhensky Vapros, the Russian term for broad range of issues concerning women. And women question was at the forefront at every discussion, major events in Russia those days. And yet in 2017, Rear Admiral Kachimazov, then director of the military training command of the Russian Navy, commented about women serving in the military and specifically on the submarines, saying that Russia does not need women serving on subs because there are enough highly educated and trained men who are capable of serving and performing duties. Well, yet in um, the same year, 2017, the Krasnodar Military Aviation School accepted their first female cadets to train as a fighter pilots for the first time in the history of the institution since 1938. And here's President Putin with um, 20, 24 graduates. So the only female deputy minister of defense in Russia, Tatyana Shevtsova, said in 2015, girls who are now beginning their military education will in 10 years be entering army. They will take up important and responsible post. And our mission is to train worthy successors and prepare a strong pool of talent for our armed forces. And according to Russia's Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, currently more than 300,000 women, civilian and active duty, um, support the military. Around 45,000 active duty female personnel serve in every branch of armed forces, including nearly 5,000 in officer ranks. And 1,100 women serve in combat in Ukraine currently and one third of them already received um, the state decorations for their achievements and they are celebrated as war heroes. So why did we witness such a radical change in Russia? Demographics. And even President Putin in 2017 stated, demography is a vital issue that will influence our country development for decades to come. And looking at the demographics, Russia's trend has been continuously more women than men in the society. Um, since like mid 20th century, as a result of World War II, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, two wars in Chechnya, military conflicts in Georgia and currently in Ukraine. Additionally, Russia, like many other nations, uh, faces aging society issues and low birth rate. So Russian government facing the reality that 
there are simply not enough capable and highly trained and educated men that can do their job and um, ensure national state security and national interest. So the government just had to address that woman question. And um, Russia, for the first time in 2017, adopted national strategy for advancement of women interest. So they revised it in 2022, and the current strategy is um, in effect through 2030. And this is a fundamental document that outlines the policies and trends and the ways to advance women is interest and issues. So perhaps here, there is an opportunity to develop strategic cooperation versus strategic competition, or perhaps a comprehensive competition, studying with soft issues like women initiatives. Because women were always working behind the scenes, always were advancing something that is very good for their families and for their countries and for their communities. So currently, women um, represent about 15% of the total number of deputies in both chambers of Russian Federal Assembly, Russian government. And women became significant stakeholders in national interest and security, and peace for that matter. And having this representation, having authority and resources, women initiate domestic and international movements, fora, net women's established women's network, such as Eurasia Women Forum. So this forum established in 2015, and this international um, gathering of women and representatives from over 80 countries, they gather together every third year and discuss the global issues. And actually, this year, 2024, the fourth um, Eurasian Women Forum will take place in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and the main theme in September, actually, and the main theme of the forum is strengthening trust and global cooperation. So the Eurasian Women Forum became a platform and mechanism uh, for women's network and advancing um, women issues and impl implementation of about dozen different projects that dedicated to empowerment of women in leadership, in politics, in business. Um, in nuclear industry, STEM program, sustainability in the Arctic, just to name the few. And they are working with G20 states, participating in W20 summit. With BRICS nations, um, they expanding women biz, like let me advance it, women uh, business alliance, they work together with um, parliamentarian leaders in um, APEC and Shanghai Corporation states. And they're also supporting Russian, if I advance it, here we go, and supporting Russia's partners like China in their One Belt, One Road initiative. So in conclusion, staying true to historical trends, like and you, you already heard that several times during our course of um, symposium here, that Russian women also saying, if not me, then who? They step up and establish national and international initiatives for women that bring change, that draw attention of international community to the issues that are common in every society. And this opens venues for cooperation. And having this strategic empathy, knowing where they're coming from, what is their values, what they're willing to fight and die for, that allows us to develop better strategies and seize opportunities to expand our network and engage women from around the world, including Russian women, on every level and work together, advance and ensure peace and security. Thank you. So I, I take no credit for this panel putting it together, but there's something very elegant from going from the grand strategic down to the micro level inside a state, even an adversary. And now we're going to get the theater, uh, the theater perspective from uh, 
from our third speaker, Dwee Turner. Over to you, Dwee. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Thank you to my expert fellow panelists for setting the stage. Hopefully, I'll be able to translate some of that big idea of great power competition to a more regional boots on the ground perspective. There we go. Okay. I have an accent, but I'm not a spy either. I am actually American, but raised in Brazil. So thanks for, for leading that as well. And for that reason, if you catch a Mrs. Pell on my slide, please let me know. I buy you coffee. And uh, you'll see predominantly I have only images to avoid that mishap. But uh, I would like to highlight three points um, that are important for the Western Hemisphere when we think about WPS and power competition. One is the strategic then the moral imperatives of WPS, and three, which I believe, and I know some of you agree with me, is truly what gives us a competitive advantage, is human connection. So when we discuss defense and security from a geopolitics perspective, from global competition, leaders at all levels often overlook the important contributions that women can make, service women, for defense and security. So what I come to understand, what I came to understand when I was the, the first chief of Women, Peace and Security at United States Southern Command is that service women provide a huge um, contribution to, to, to human capital. And I think we have throughout the, the lectures and the discussions today um, understood that as well. Creating highly collaborative relationships, enduring relationships that in the long run paved the way for a more balanced and cohesive global order and in discussing here the Western Hemisphere regional order. From a U.S. perspective, when we think of the great power competition for geopolitical influence, it's, it's very quickly we're thinking of United States, China, and Russia. And it's in this context that we're easily absorbed in a narrative that focuses on hard power, hard military power. Uh, some of you here for the U.S., you, you might remember the, the boxer's stance that was in the, in the previous strategy. Well, try to do that if half of your population is not in the equation and you're fighting with only one hand. We're talking about economic influence and the cutting edge for technology, now very well discussed cyber. However, today and in this conference and, and widely in the WPS uh, arena, we have a opportunity to broaden our horizons and see how WPS really gives us an advantage for uh, our competing our, our opponents. So I think it's worth uh, in this juncture ask an important question, specifically for, for the Southcom perspective and, and, and players here all the way from the United States to, to far as south as, as Argentina and is how do prominent regional and international actors whose actions have a high projection in our hemisphere, how do they align or diverge with women, peace and security principles and perspectives? Well, I'll we'll start with the United States. Uh, in recent years, the United States in the inter-American system has worked really hard on women, peace and security, leaning towards capacity building, diplomacy and collaboration. This taking place, and I'm sure many of you work in this arena, um, security cooperation activities, military education, professional development. The U.S. has frequently and now constantly, consistently, emphasizing how it is important, why it is important to promote gender equality, women's empowerment, inclusion in security and defense. Not perfectly, we know that, but consistently and authentically. Now, when we look at other actors, let's talk about China, has in the Western Hemisphere expanded greatly its economic presence in the region through investments and infrastructure, but its initiatives with women, peace, and security are minimal. In dozens, and I, I might attempt to say even hundreds of events that I have participated, either actively or observing, I have only seen one Chinese representative. And, and this person was not even actively participating. And I know that others have observed the same. And I, and I don't know if Dr. Valerie Hudson is here. That is the data of one. Uh, please forgive me, maybe in a few years, I will be a little bit more quantitative and come with some statistical analysis on that. But this anecdote I think is important because really there's virtually no presence of a Chinese influence when it comes to building connections in the women, peace and security space. 
Well, we see that, that they do promote um, the financial and the economics, the infrastructure to a very large scale, but their understakings that they do in this sphere do not compare at all with what we do, the United States, in, in our presence. And in much of China, it has questionable geopolitical reasons for what they're doing and what they're doing in our hemisphere. As for Russia, thank you so much for that input. This is the most I ever seen uh, Russia doing anything on WPS with the women, uh, with the bouquets that Putin normally, you know, generally, you always, when he interacts with a woman, he has this gigantic flower of bou a bouquet of flowers. This is the first time I, I see any interaction really. In our hemisphere, is, is inter the interaction of Russia and women, peace and security is basically no. There is some soft power interactions, yes, some businesses, but in the realm of connecting uh, the human domain and paying attention to it is not existent, non-existent, and I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, right? So when we look at those, uh, these powers and when we enter in the sphere of morals and shared values, the WPS framework intrinsically aligned with democratic, with democratic principles that are fundamental for moral values, particularly in our hemisphere. Collaboration, we talked about that earlier, trust, professionalism, security, safety, values of consolidating or consolidated democracies. So by adopting these principles, we convey a message that's very strong. We have positive and proactive leadership that our competitors cannot by any means contest. So it does give us an advantage. I'm gonna throw a curve, curveball at you because perhaps the, the most contrast, contrasting element of power competition in our hemisphere is a non-state actor, transnational crime organizations that represent a unique challenge for the entire hemisphere. These entities driven by profit and, and, and power worsen gender equality, worsen gender inequalities, right? We talk about human trafficking, forced labor, gender-based violence, recruiting young women, boys, girls, for those illicit practices. These operations, by its very nature, counter the principles of women, peace, and security, making them not only our competitors, quote unquote, but truly a, a, a threat to our day and age. So my last point, again, the, the human connection, building on connections that promote the understanding of, 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 of cultures, the understanding of democratic nations, interoperability, which is essential for establishing long-lasting relationships and partnerships in our hemisphere. We're talking about cohesion, coordination, collaboration, allowing for greater military effectiveness and efficiency. This cannot happen if we don't dynamically include the perspectives of women and the contributions of women in our armed forces and you know, for, a, for a different discussion, much larger in our societies. Here in this, uh, in this slide, you'll see some, um, some examples of what I believe that I, I, I had the honor of experience those that demonstrate the strength and the relevance of women, peace and security. Bilateral and multilateral meetings, Chile at Secopac with the Minister of Defense, um, Ms. Maya Fernandez, Suriname with, again, the Minister of Defense, Krishna Matuera. We have Jamaica, which we have the Chad visiting us here, uh, the, the, the first Chad in our hemisphere for sure, and likely the world to be a woman Chad, assuming, not because she's a woman, but because of the talent, and we know that. Uh, Peru talking about human rights and Brazil roundtable. On, on, on women's perspective. And then some, some more uh, you know, discrete examples here in Guyana, Brigadier Bass. I want to highlight the change that can happen. In, in, in Brigadier Bass, uh, in 2020, I think it was, he, he came to Southcom to have a strategic meeting with Admiral Fowler at the time and was very high level. And, and WPS was uh, a, like a secondary, it's still present, but it was, it was not a focus and it was not fully understood. Within two years of that, from that key leader engagement and through a lot of training, conversations, discussions, boots on the ground, he hosted a uh, Caribbean WPS conference with 13 countries and the United States being a champion to talk about how we can, no kidding, operationalize women, peace and security in our armed forces. We see here Colombia, which I, I have a soft spot for Colombia. A lot of engagement from the strategic to the operational level 
and we see progress very quickly too. Um, the 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 SEAC, the equivalent SEAC, the highest enlisted person in, for the Joint Forces in Colombia now is a woman, Command Sergeant Major Consuelo Diaz, who very expertly is leading that role. Again, not because she's a woman, but because she provides a a a, a lot of talent and capability. And finally, trade wins. And here's just to illustrate when we participated in trade wins in scenarios that related for women, peace, and security in all tracks, ground, maritime, I mean, you name it. And here, um, five miles into the Belizean jungle and really making it relevant, how we can, no kidding, include gender perspectives in that domain. What does it mean for the woman and the man that are supporting us in those contexts and being able to tailorize that information? So we're looking and creating relationships at every level, again, tactical all the way down to, to garrison. There we go. Okay, so just to conclude some final additional comments, um, the traditional contrast between soft power and hard power is becoming less evident in our interconnected world, right? The definition of what a strategic advantage is, is, is changing and changing rapidly. And smart power as the theme, part of the, the theme of the, the symposium, largely factors into it and is highly aligned with women, peace, and security. So when we align our forces and our principles with women, peace, and security, we definitely deepen uh, our connections, our interoperability, our capacity to relate and empathize with our partners. We gain, certainly, a competitive edge over our adversaries. And in this capacity, we have forces that are more capable of disrupting, deterring, and dismantle the challenges that we currently face. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey, for an absolute uh, tour de force of uh, talking about a theater so efficiently. So thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to uh, bring this panel to a conclusion by just reiterating Dewey's excellent call to all you guys out there um, as middle management uh, to get, get to work. And please join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent discussion. Thank you.